Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And once again, on behalf of Mark, Alice, and myself, we want to greet you in the wonderful, the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes. As we gather once again to go into the Word so that we might see Him more clearly, that we might be more like Him, all for the glory of the Father. So we are trusting in the presence of the Holy Spirit who has been sent to us to lead us into all truth, who indwells us Thank you, Lord. to guide us through this time. What would we do without Him? And not only that, I'm... I'm Asking for your prayers. And, yes. and by the way, time is not what you think it is. So you can pray when you see this, and it'll have impact on us even as we film it. That's right. So be praying for us as we can pray for you. So we're going to finish up in our study for the last, gosh, I, I don't know, seven weeks. We have been looking at what the well-dressed Christian wears, talking about putting on armor as light, putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then primarily the focus has been on the, full, the whole armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6. And that's what we're going to finish up today. And, and then we'll see where the Lord takes us from there. But before we do that, I'm going to ask Mark if you'll just ask God's blessing upon our time together today. Oh Lord, we thank you for your word. Just enlighten us and let us see your word and seize upon it to give to others. Amen. Amen. And put a guard over my mouth, Lord. All right. We left off last week. We were talking about this as we were coming to the conclusion mm -hmm. of the whole armor of God, talking about the sword of the spirit, the word of God. Right. right. And uh, we had talked about the helmet of salvation before that. Talked about propaganda. So we left off in that last study <laughs> talking about the fact that the devil, our adversary, that old devil, is trying to level the playing field. Mm -hmm. You see, he has been disarmed. Yes. So now he wants to disarm us right. to level the playing field, battlefield, actually. So he will try to either make, using the word illegal, mm -hmm. unlawful, mm -hmm. as a, to be used as a weapon, mm -hmm. to break the weapon or to make it ineffective, or make us lose all thoughts of the weapon. That's what he has to do to bring us down to his level for the battle, right? And we don't want to go there. Not at all. But bear in mind, we're living in a day and age, and I truly believe that this is the final age, but that's neither here nor there for the purpose of this study. But Amos spoke so long ago, the prophet Amos, God spoke to Amos, and he said, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land. Not a famine for, the, for bread or a thirst for water, but rather for hearing the words of the Lord. People will stagger from sea to sea and from the north even to the east. They will go to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. Amos 8, 11 and 12. Well, that's a bit of a scary verse when you stop to think about it. But it's not a famine for the, for the word being there. It's a famine for the hearing of the word. And I see more and more people who are not hearing, their ears are clogged or something, okay? Oh, they become dull. And it's not because the Lord doesn't desire that they have the word. Au contraire. Au contraire, as my sweet patootie says. I want to read to you again another verse. Listen to the word of the Lord, O sons of Israel, for the Lord has a case against the inhabitants of the land because there is no faithfulness or kindness or knowledge of God in the land. There is swearing, deception, murder, stealing, and adultery. They employ violence so that bloodshed follows bloodshed. Hosea 4, 1 and 2. Does that sound like a time that we recognize? Yes, it if it was true back then, I promise you it is even more, more so, so today, today, or at least in quantity. So there's a cause why there is a famine for the hearing of the word. And this is what the Lord says. Here's, here's why that's happening. Because of this ungodliness mm -hmm. among his people. people. Right. Right? How can this happen when there are so many Bibles, lots of Bibles, and there are so many preachers, so many preachers and teachers on radio and television? How can this happen when there are so many churches? Easy. Just 
get them away from the work. Distract them. Well, I want to talk about some of the primary reasons that this is happening, all right? When it comes to getting separated from the word, it's because of translations. Mm -hmm. It's because of commentaries. It's because of the tradition of men. And it's because of distractions. Think about the quote-unquote church of Laodicea. Right. <clears throat> now, it's certainly in Greek, it says it's an assembly, okay? Yes. Which is a term that's always used for churches back then. Whether it's a church or not, well, Jesus is speaking to them and calling them, all right? So it's like he has, should have a relationship with them. And yet, he is not present in their midst, all right? Jesus Christ, the word who was made flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ, who is coming back, the word of God written on his thigh, right? Mm -hmm. Yet, in the church of Laodicea, the word is not present. Not at all. Not at all present in that church. How do I know that? Because he's outside. Mm -hmm. And it's a church that literally makes him sick to his stomach. Go read Revelation chapter 3. See for yourself, right? He inhabits the praise of his people, it says in his word. Mm -hmm. So they're not praising him no. inside that church. Otherwise, he'd be there. You know, maybe they're singing pretty songs, but it's not the praise of God. It says, the two or more gather in my name. There I am in their midst. That's the promise of Jesus. Well, he's not in their midst, so, so they can't be, they're gathered, name. but they're not gathered in his name. Right. They have gathered for a different reason. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can go on and on and on, but the simple fact of the matter, there's got to be preaching, but I'm telling you, the preaching is not the word of God, right. because otherwise he'd be inside, not outside. Mm -hmm. Think about that. This is the last picture of a church in the entire Bible mm -hmm. on earth, mm -hmm. the church of Laodicea. It is a church that is devoid of Jesus who is the word of God. Can I um, just say this? You spoke, uh, I think it was Sunday, about we were talking about the church of Landacy, and we were talking about how Satan imitates whatever God is doing. Yes, he would make, him, he would make himself like the, the most, most high God, God, yes. And you said that you believed in that the church of Laodicea definitely was a church. It was Satan's church. Because he's yes. trying to imitate. He's, yes. You know, Jesus said that, that he would build his church. Right. Yeah. He would build his church. Well, Satan, who is an imitator, trying to imitate God. Go read he's Isaiah 14, right? Church. He's building his church. And the church that he's building, the gathering that he's building, is a gathering devoid of the presence of the Lord. Right. Why? Because it can't, no man can serve two masters. Yeah. It can't be one where Jesus and the devil are equally accepted. Right. It's one or the other. It cannot coexist. It truly is yeah. binary, That's one right. or the other, yeah. all right? But think about that church of Laodicea. Here's a group of people calling themselves Christians, calling themselves a church, mm -hmm. and it says, and Jesus is saying to them, because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Revelation 3.17. Mm. How can you get to the state where you think you have everything when in fact you have nothing? Absolutely. Nothing of value. Without Christ, I promise you, there's no life. Without Christ, there's no value to anything, right? So this is Satan making the sword. Remember, it says in Hebrews 4, this word that we're talking about, this word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. Satan wants to make it ineffective. Mm -hmm. How can you make a sword ineffective? Well, one way is make it very, very dull. Mm -hmm. Well, you say, well, it's sharper. You know, there was a time when, when Saul was becoming the first king of Israel. Mm -hmm. And the Philistines kind of dominated the land, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And the Philistines would not let the Israelites have sharpened weapons. They wouldn't even let them have blacksmiths. Wow. So what would happen was with the Israelites, if they wanted to have their hoe, their, their farm tools, their right. agricultural tools sharpened, they had to go to the Philistines. Mm. That way they controlled the fact that the, the, the Hebrews could not make weapons. Right. Okay. Right. So it's the same kind of way today. It's like, 
Satan will let you have the things you want as long as it's not a weapon that can be used against him. Mm -hmm. yeah. in, in, in Belize, they let you have guns, just no bullets. Yeah, that's, that's, that's true. What Mark is saying is true. You, yeah. could, you, didn't need a, you didn't need a license to get a gun. You needed a license to get a bullet. That's right. And the other thing is, when we lived in Belize, you know, we lived out in the bush. Everybody, I mean, everybody outside the city, you always walk around with a machete. machete. You know, I mean, I, I don't think I ever went any place with, in, the, in the bush without a machete. I mean, you need that machete. That said, everybody that you saw with a machete, every guy walking around with a machete would have a file in his back pocket. Mm, to sharpen it. To, to keep, keep it, it sharp. To keep it sharp. Keep it sharp. The word in you. And remember, God has written his word on the tablets of your heart. The word in you needs to be kept sharp. Because Satan, like I said, he will let you use the word as long as it's not a threat to him. He'll certainly let you use a word if it's your word and not God's. Mm. Now, I, let me try and make that a little more clear because, you see, there's a lot of Christians running around and they're making proclamations, thus says the Lord and so forth. But the question is, did God tell them to say that? Has God given them that word? All scripture is profitable, okay? Mm -hmm. All scripture has been given. Whatever was written in earlier times was written, that we would have encouragement. Everything that has been written from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, mm -hmm. everything has been written for our encouragement and for our instruction. Not everything has been written to us. It's all been written for us, yes. but it's not been all written to us. And if you don't like that, I ask you to go pray about it because I promise you, if you start praying about it, God will reveal to you that there are a lot of things in this word that he has said to people you don't want him to say to you. Depart from me, you evil one. I never knew you. Matthew chapter 7. Don't want to hear that. No. So bear that in mind, okay? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You have to hear God speak to you. If any man speaks, let him speak as it were the utterances of God. But Jesus didn't speak anything on his own unless he heard it from the Father to him, right? That's right. So be careful about how you handle the word. A lot of people are, are just, they're, they're using the word when they have no right to use the word in the way that they're using it, okay? Put on the whole arm of God day by day, every day. And then in verse 18, now I'm going to say this now and I'm going to come back to it. He said, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So we're going to come to this. This is a day by day thing. You don't put the whole armor of God on and that's the end of it. I mean, you got to do this. You got to get dressed up every day when you wake up, right? Mm -hmm. But let's look some, at some of the things that affect the power of the word of God in our lives. I'm going to talk about translations, and this, I know, is a sensitive subject, and it should not be. You know why? Because love rejoices in the truth, and we want to find the truth. There is a book that I would highly recommend. I read this years ago, um, recommended by a friend who, who knew this fellow. The book is called The Word of God in English. It was written by Leland Riken, who is a professor uh, of English. At Wheaton College, you know, Christian College. Mm -hmm. and it was published by Crossway's book in 2002. It is a really good book, a scholarly kind of book. I mean, it's, it's, it, you can read it mm -hmm. about the different translations of the Bible and the concept, the theory of translations, right? Mm -hmm. I want to read you one of the things that he said in it. Okay. Right? He said that a good English translation, talking about the Bible, mm -hmm. preserves the words of the original insofar as the process of translation allows it. Translation of ideas or thoughts is a logical fallacy and a linguistic fantasy. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, readers can know what the Bible means. In order to know what it means, they need to know what it says. Right. You can't know what it means if you don't know what it says. Right? Mm -hmm. Translators have no right to assume the role of priests doling out the right interpretations to the masses. Mm -hmm. They don't. No. That's the job of the Holy That's Spirit. Right. The Holy Spirit was sent to lead you into the truth, right? right? 
if you can compare, and you know, there are a lot of people who say, well, okay, well, the only version is the King James. Well, that's a literal, w- w- one of the ways we call it is a literal translation. Mm-hmm. So is the New American Standard, so is the English Standard Version. You need to get to understand the difference between versions if you care about the Word of God, right? Mm-hmm. But I just want to give you an example, right? I want, to, I want to tell you what the King James says, and then I'm going to tell you what one of the most popular modern translations of the day today says. Mm-hmm. In the King James, I'm reading from Zechariah chapter 13, verse 6. And you might want to open and read along with this because you'll see the difference in different translations, right? In the King James, it says, And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hands? And then he shall answer, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends, that has always been taken in, in the church to be an understanding of Christ being nailed to the cross in the house of his friends. All right. So now having said that, listen to these words. And if someone says, and so where did you get that black eye? They'll say, I ran into a door at a friend's house. That sounds almost like a joke that they would even put that in there. It certainly doesn't say the same thing. Not there's no nothing close. Nothing close. There there was something that you said this weekend about the guy who did that translation. And if the same guy would do a translation of the Quran in the same way. He'd be dead. He'd be a fatwa after him and he'd be dead. He would, yeah. He would. Um, Unfortunately for us, the church doesn't seem to take the word of God as seriously Mm -hmm. as some Muslims take the Quran. That's right. And by the way, the word of God has power that the Quran does not. Okay. Where, where is this Bible? Like I said, it's one of the most popular in a lot of mega churches. It's used by a lot of ministries. It has been endorsed, endorsed by some of the biggest names in Christian in the Christian church. I want to read you one review because this one review struck me. And this is going back a long time. This is the quote. Translated by one amazing guy. It is as far from the old King James as one can imagine. For those who find the Bible warmed over old news. The message is like reading it for the first time. Wow. If if I had written something and that was a review, Mm-mm. oh my goodness gracious, I'd be on my face before God saying, I, I, what did I do wrong? All right. A living word. Living word. We did. And as I say, I know this is a sensitive subject, but the fact of the matter is years ago, um, I, when the message was fairly new, mm-hmm. I did a two- part study of the message thing in upstate New York for a group up there. Yes. And that is available on the Bible Talk website, right? Um, so you you can either, if you'd like to hear it, write to me, I'll send you the link. I also have the PDF notes that we used. The word is precious. Yes, it is. Treated it so, okay? Words have power. And remember, what God spoke through through in the time of Moses in Deuteronomy 4 2, he said, You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. And then at the end of the Bible, in Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19, mm-hmm. he said, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city, which are written in this book. This is this is a serious, dangerous thing very, to be adding to, taking away, or changing the word of God. They, they evidently don't believe it. Well, talk to the Lord about it, will you? <laughs> commentaries. Now, commentaries can be good. Yeah, That's my emphasis, by the way. God has appointed teachers in the church, Mm -hmm. but not all teachers are appointed by God. Right. I was saying to Mark, they were talking about somebody, a big famous preacher. And I said, well, if you hear people start to talk about him, because generally if they get on the subject, they'll talk about him. They won't talk about God. Mm -hmm. I was just saying, how did you test him? 
How, how do you test them? If you start talking to me about somebody and you go on and on about a, a, a pastor, a teacher, I may say to you, how did you test them? Because the word of God says, First John, John wrote, First John 4, mm-hmm. he said, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So you got to test these things. How many times have I said that here during this series? Don't, don't take my word for it. Test me. Don't trust me. Test me. Check on what I say. Scripture interprets Scripture. And there is a warning. You know, God spoke to, through James, James 3, 1, and said, Let not many of you become teachers. Mm-hmm. My brethren, knowing that as such, we will incur a stricter judgment. Today, it's like anybody that has Facebook. All of a sudden, they're teachers, they're prophets, they're apostles. Be very, very prayerful. Very, very prayerful. Because remember, you can incur a stricter judgment. We are to be like the Bereans in the book of Acts. You know, it talks about Paul when he was traveling and uh, on his way before he got to Corinth to go over to Greece and Athens. He says, now these were more noble minded, these being the Bereans, were more noble minded than those in Thessalonica. For they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Acts 17, 11. If you hear something, examine the scriptures, see if it's so. Don't take it, right? Commentaries can be good. But they don't replace the word of God. They don't become more important than the word of God, which I see happening all the time. And that's what happened in the, in the Jewish religion. The Talmud. The Talmud is not the Bible. Yeah. Okay, it's not or the Torah. These are, that's the Bible. So that's scripture. The Talmud is commentary. All right. The, the, the Talmud, which is commentaries, contain the teachings and opinions of thousands of rabbis dating from before the birth of Christ through the 5th century after the birth of Christ on a variety of subjects, including the law, Jewish ethics, philosophy, customs, history, law, and many other topics. The Talmud is the basis. It has has become the basis for all codes of Jewish law. In other words, what has happened is what a rabbi says about the scripture has become more important than the scripture itself. And you want to know something? I see that happening in Christianity. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, Alice and I have been blessed. And I mean, Mark has traveled with us in many places. You know, I go places and I start talking to people about Jesus. And I'll say, well, the word says, the word says. And they'll say, well, this guy says, and this guy says, oh, oh wait a minute. It's, it's good that there are teachers anointed and appointed by God out there. But make sure that it doesn't start to replace the word of God in your life. All right. Traditions is the other thing. In Mark chapter 7, Jesus said that he's talking to the Pharisees and scribes. And they were accusing him. They were saying, you know, why don't your disciples walk according to the tradition of elders? Because they were walking through on the Sabbath and, and eating. They hadn't washed their hands, right? Mm-hmm. And Jesus said, this is Matthew 7, verse 6. Oh, he said, I, I, I'm sorry, what did I just say? Matthew. No, it is Mark. Thank you, my sweet. Okay. And he said to them, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written. This people honors me with their lips but their heart is far from me, far away from me. But in vain do they teach, in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. He was also saying to them, you are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. The true danger arises when the tradition of men supplants the commandment of God. Now, obviously, in Jesus' statement that I just read, mm-hmm. the traditions were not in line with the commandments. Right. Yeah. Ergo, every mm-hmm. tradition should be tested according to the word, mm-hmm. tested against the word. If the tradition conflicts with the word or is not supported by the word, it should not be a part of our lives. How did it ever get there in the first place? Because it's pleasant. It yeah. tickles the ears. And you keep hearing it and hearing it. Or it serves the purpose of somebody to bring something in to you that's not necessarily true okay you got to think this is simple and logical i love this you and you all probably know this psalm 23 
David wrote, He restoreth my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. That's verse 3 in Psalm 23, right? God leads us. How does he lead us? Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Psalm 119, verse 105. The Spirit of God quickens the word to us. All right? And that's how God leads us, is with his word. So what happens when you put the word aside? You are in trouble. You're in grave danger. Is there any other kind of danger? No, it's grave, perilous danger. And, right. and going back to what you said, how does that happen? How do people just follow the tradition? It's because there's nobody jumping in and saying, hey, that's not what the Word says. No, and it gets to the place where the tradition becomes so ingrained right. in, the, in the culture of the church that it's, it's heretical to say anything against it. Right. Now, I'm not going to talk about Christmas right now. Oh, boy. I'm not... <laughs> Christmas, but what about how about Easter? Easter? <laughs> well, Passover. Have, well, it's true. Easter has replaced the Passover. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about being legalistic as a Jew, because the New Testament, the Word of God, it says that Jesus is our Passover. Well, I'm not going to have time to go into that. Yeah. I want to talk about distractions in the few little time I have left, right? Yes. The, the, by, the dictionary defines distractions as something to draw the attention of a person away from something mm -hmm. or to divide and confuse the attention of a per person to amuse or entertain now the etymology of that the root of this word comes from the latin and it means to draw asunder or apart to turn aside it comes from the latin word distractus which means to draw in different directions mm -hmm. right distraction to draw away. Can you see the relationship between distract and subtract? Yeah, take away. They both have the same Latin, okay. right? Yeah. Because subtract, subtract has the same same root, and it, it, it also means to draw away from beneath. Mm -hmm. You're taking away, right? You're subtracting, you're taking away something. Mm -hmm. Satan, the adversary who desires to separate you from the Lord, separate all of us from the Lord. Or if you're not yet saved, so he desires to keep you, keep you separate from the Lord. Mm -hmm. He also desires to keep believers separate from each other. Yes. To bring division among us. That's what Solomon wrote, because think about this. Two are better than one for their labor. They have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion but woe to the one who is alone when he falls, for there is not another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together to keep warm, how will one be warm alone? And if one can overpower him who is alone, two shall withstand him. A cord of three strands is not easily broken, not quickly torn apart. Satan wants to divide us because he's afraid of us when we're together. Right, absolutely. Because if he takes a shot at you, there's going to be a brother or sister there that say, yo, yo, okay? Get behind me. All right. So, well, you know what? So we're out of time. How, how did that happen? All right. Be back next week. And next week we'll conclude, I promise you. <laughs> Father, we just thank you, Lord God. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your word, that living word, that seed that brought us into this relationship with you that nourishes our spirit every single day. We praise you and thank you for your word who was made flesh and dwelt among us, your son, Jesus Christ. Bless you. God bless you and goodbye till next time. Bye. I will cling to that old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a cross. Thank you.